good morning. Let's begin our worship this morning by singing the hymn of the day. We'll stand as we sing. It's on the front of your bulletin. From age to age, exalt his name. going to read scripture for us. I'd like to read this morning from Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses. He deeds to his people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, 
or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass, they flourish like a flower of the field, the wind blows over it and it is gone. Its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children. With those who keep his covenant and obey, remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, and his mighty, and mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host. You his servants will do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. All right, <clears throat> let's seek the Lord in prayer. Our God and Father, who else but the beloved of the Lord can use both of those titles, God and Father? We are taught, Lord, from your apostle that we address as Father the one who judges all. And therefore, Lord, we realize that no longer do we have to relate to you as a criminal to a judge, but as a child to a father. As such, Lord, we come to you today and ask that indeed, as a father pities his children, so will you will have mercy on us as we gather here this morning for worship. Of all the things that we do, Lord, we feel most the need of your grace and mercy and help in this matter of worship. There is so much to distract us, the concerns of the day, our flesh's natural aversion to the things of God. But we have gathered, Lord, for the purpose of worship. We pray that you'd send us the Spirit by which we are enabled to worship. May he take those things which belong to Christ and show them to us. May he reveal to us through the preaching of your word. May he give us fresh revelations of our beloved Savior, that we might see his glory more than we did before, that we might trust him more perfectly and rejoice in him with greater gladness than ever before. We ask, Father, that you give us what no one else but you can give, and that's spiritual blessings in Christ. It is written, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. So, Lord, in Christ, grant us these blessings. We pray that each one who is gathered here will receive the blessing they need for this time. That the word will impact their hearts, either to give them spiritual life or to nourish, nourish spiritual light that's already there. Father, forgive our sins. And may we be as ready to forgive the sins of others against us as we are to ask for the forgiveness of sins we commit against you. Deliver us from the evil one and from any who work as his agents in this world who, according to the natural flesh, despise the things of God and therefore despise the people of God. Lord, we pray that in our nation, you would grant some wisdom to those who lead us and that they would govern in such a way that we 
who are your people, may continue to worship you and live our lives in quietness and peace. Thank you, Lord, for all the day-to-day -day provisions that you give us. Day after day after day, Lord, you provide us with everything we need and more. And we've come, become so accustomed to it that we don't give thanks as much as we ought. There are many in this world, Lord, who do not have enough. And yet you give us an abundance. And we are thankful. And Lord, from your generosity towards us, may we learn of generosity toward others. Lord, we pray for other churches which gather in the name of Christ today. We pray they do so in truth for our sister churches here and there whom we know. And we know that you've shown them the truth. We pray for them as we have for us that you would give them in their worship services fresh revelations of Christ. We pray especially for the church in Danville who here a couple of months ago, their pastor was taken away to glory. And we pray that you would provide for them another man to lead them, a man of faithfulness, a man of truth. And Lord, we pray for the other churches as well. Lift up their pastors, their teachers. Strengthen them. Give them boldness to proclaim the truth. We think of Brother Drew Dietz. And Lord, we thank you for his faithfulness, the faithfulness you've given him. Help him today. For Brother Donnie Bell in Crossville, and Chris Cunningham, Milton Howard. Lord, there's too many to name them all. We give you thanks for all of them. And pray you'd bless them today. And we pray all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, we'll sing from our chorus book, number six. Number six from the chorus book. It's the ring binder. Lord, with glowing heart, I'd praise thee. <clears throat>
before the message, we'll sing hymn number 42, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. 42. <clears throat> we'll stand together as we sing. <clears throat> seated. I got it in my mind to put some siding on the, our garage, so I called for my son to come help me, and uh, so he came this past week, we've been doing it, and he offered to preach for me, well, preach for us, but preach in my place, and I'm always ready for him to do that, so Nathan, if you come up and Bring us the message God's laid on your hearts. And I'm going to go back there and make sure the volume's at a level that you let me know. When he starts speaking, I'll be there at the knob. You let me know if it's right. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be here, but every time I'm here, it's always either too hot or too cold. <laughs> Just seems the way it is. Uh, this morning's message will be out of Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12. And when I was preparing this, um, I was preparing it for uh, my children, two of them that aren't with me, they're all back at home. And all the children that were in our church, they were just on my mind. And I remember back to my youth, there were a lot of messages where I heard, uh, I heard the words, but I didn't know what they meant. So I prepared this for children. And it's not as if, you know, the adults can just tune out. <laughs> this is good for everybody. But I wanted the children to be able to understand something that actually is very difficult to understand. It's not something a child can wrap his mind around very easily. Now, we'll be out of uh, Exodus 12, and this is a story about the first 
Passover. The first Passover instituted in the time of Moses when the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians. And I wanted to mention first two things. First of all, the word slay. Slay, not Santa's slay, to kill someone, to slay someone. That is to kill someone. They want to, or in our times might be called murder. That's a word that will appear here. And the second thing, the word, um, something to describe Jesus. It says in the book of Revelations 13, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That is from the beginning. He was the lamb slain. So let's read, starting in verse 1 of chapter 12. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. So speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall take your count for the lamb. And this part is important. Your lamb shall be without blemish, that is, without an imperfection, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Now skip ahead to verse 12. <clears throat> God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's a declaration and that's a promise. Now why does God care about blood so much? To answer that, we must know first who God is. Now despite what you may see or hear in the other churches or on TV, God is not an old man with a long beard sitting on a big chair, and he just watches things happen. He doesn't watch things happen. God is not a watcher. He is a doer. He is involved in everything that happens, and he is active all the time. He makes things happen and he can make things end he created the stars he created the sun he created the moon this planet and everything else before anything was there was nothing and then there was something that's what he can do and he knows what has happened he knows what will happen because he is in control of everything and he even knows what your thoughts are Right now, back when you thought mom and dad didn't see you, and later on, he, can, he knows your thoughts, and you cannot hide anything from God. Secondly, God is king over all. He's not just king of the earth. He's king of the sun, the moon, the stars. He's king in heaven. He's king everywhere. And there is no one better or more powerful than God. He's right at the top. And that means God gets to decide what is good and what is bad. 
That's not for you to decide. That's not for elected officials to decide, the president or somebody else. It's for God to decide. Now, when something is bad, it is called sin. God calls it sin. And when something is good, it is called righteous. Now, God is righteous, of course, which means he is good. And there's no sin in him at all. He doesn't lie. He doesn't cheat. <clears throat> he doesn't break a promise. He doesn't steal. And everything that comes from God is righteous. And he doesn't like sin. It's not something he not only doesn't tolerate. When he sees sin, he must destroy it. Sin cannot be present with God. Unfortunately, that sin is in every person, and it says that in the Bible, it says that all people are born as sinners. Not one has been born righteous. Not any sons of Adam, the first man. All people are born with sin, even the president, the teachers, mommies and daddies, cute little babies, they're all born as sinners. And everyone has sin. No one is born righteous, as it says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7 and verse 20. And if our lives were a TV show, we would all be the bad guys. God would be the one good guy. So, we all have sin in us. And based on what I just said, that means God must destroy us. But calm down. We're clearly not destroyed. We're all here. But you have heard what happens if you die with sin, haven't you? If you die, this body ceases to live. What happens? If you die as a sinner, you go to hell. And in hell, you burn forever. That's just what it says in the Bible. And you burn forever because you must suffer the consequences of your sins. There are no second chances after you get there. There's no timeouts. And there is no forgiveness. You don't burn away your sins and then go to heaven. Once you are in hell, you're there for good. So, why are we all alive right here, right now, if we all have sin. Why does God allow even anyone to live if everyone is a sinner? Well, the reason's this. Because God loved certain people, and he wanted them to be with him. And so he made a plan to save some people and change them from bad to good, from sinners to righteous people. But that plan that God made needed someone who was righteous to begin with. He needed someone who was righteous and perfect to sacrifice themselves for his people, the ones that he chose. So what does, this have to, what does all this have to do with the blood of a lamb? How does that help God's people? I mean, this happened thousands of years ago. Well, because this story is about Jesus Christ. He doesn't appear here in name. But Jesus Christ, God's righteous son, he was born that way and he stayed that way. It's about him. And he's the only person that can save sinners. There's no one outside of him. Don't look to angels, don't look to anybody else. Just look to that one person. It's real simple. And many of the stories in the Bible, they are what's called analogies. They are stories with people or things that mean something else. You take something from that thing mentioned and apply it to something else. And sometimes the people or things in these stories, they're symbols. They're symbols. For example, you could say that your dad is as strong as a big horse. Your dad's not a big horse, but he's strong like a big horse. Big horses can pull 
heavy things, and they have lots of muscles, and maybe your dad's unlike me. I don't got them. But it could be like, like a big horse with all that strength. That strength is a symbol to show a part of your dad. Or your mom might be as sweet as sugar. She's not made of sugar, but she's sweet like sugar is sweet. These are just symbols. And in this story that we're seeing in Exodus, the lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ. Like that lamb that was slain or killed for its blood, Jesus was slain for his blood. Because it says in 1 John 1, verse 7, it says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's nothing else in that sentence that cleanses us from sin. It's just the blood. So, can anything's blood be put on the doorposts? No, because God said to use the blood of a lamb. And in the story, God says that it must be blood from a lamb, a young sheep without any problems. Just perfect. I don't know what a perfect sheep looks like. I guess they don't have any spots or anything like that. Maybe all white wool. <clears throat> Nothing, no other colors mixed in. Now again, this lamb is just like Jesus Christ, and he was born of a woman, but his father was God. His father wasn't a son of Adam, wasn't the son of a sinner. And he did not have any sin in him. He was a perfect baby. He was a perfect child. He was then a perfect teenager, and he grew into a perfect adult. He stayed that way his whole life. He did not sin at any time in his life, even though he was tempted unto sin. It, the Bible says he was tempted in all ways like us, but found without sin. So that time you put your hand in the cookie jar and took one out, because, and you weren't supposed to, he didn't do that. And that's just a little thing. The big sins, as we call them. He didn't do those either. He didn't hate. <laughs> I don't know if there's a day go by that goes by I don't hate something. Hopefully not someone. You work on it, but <laughs> it never gets out. But Jesus, he was perfect. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, in that sentence, who must see the blood? It is important that God sees the blood. It doesn't matter if your neighbor sees it or your parents. It doesn't matter if your friends or your classmates see it. God must see it, and then God must accept that it is good and righteous blood. It cannot have any sin or guilt in it, or God will not pass over you, and you will die. Now, who or what provides the blood that God wants to see? It isn't the sinner. It isn't the man's, anybody in that man's household. It's not the sinner on whose door the blood appears. And in fact, the sinner doesn't even suffer a scratch or a bruise or a scrape. That sinner remains the same before and after that lamb was slain. The sinner's husband or wife, they're not hurt. The children in that household, they're not hurt. The sinner doesn't get hurt at all. But the lamb gets hurt a lot. The lamb dies in place of the sinner. It's called substitution. Just as Jesus Christ died in the place of God's chosen people. 
Now you see in this story, God's not coming as if to visit a friend. He's not bringing pie. He is coming in the power of his wrath, it says. Now wrath is a strong anger, it's very violent. And God in his wrath is not trying to give everyone just some bruises. Just beat them up until their sins are are gone. Yes, that's good enough. You've paid for it with this pain. No, we know that God must destroy sin utterly. He is coming to destroy that sin, even if that sin is inside a person. So how can God's wrath pass over you? If it is coming for your death, because God's justice, that's a sense of right and wrong, will not be satisfied and cannot be satisfied if your sin is not punished and destroyed. Now this is where the blood of the Lamb comes in. In our story about the Israelites slaying a perfect Lamb, it is the blood of the Lamb that is proof that something was once alive and has been killed. That blood is the proof. When everybody's living just fine, the blood stays in. It stays inside. But when something is slain, the blood is spilled. And in fact, it wasn't an accident that the lamb died and wasn't an accident that Jesus died. Because it uses the word slain. That's to kill on purpose. So that was innocent blood. That was perfect blood. The lamb had done nothing wrong. And that blood was shed for the Israelites who had done a lot wrong. I don't know of any of the stories you remember from the Bible or what you had been taught. The Israelites did a lot wrong before this and after this. So just as they should have died that night for their sins, so should you and me die for our sins. But if a perfect substitute dies for you instead, you get to live. Now this is the great analogy that our story is talking about. When the lamb's innocent blood is set upon your soul or your heart or your spirit, God's wrath acknowledges, says, I see that, I see that. God's wrath acknowledges that a death has already occurred there. Even though it wasn't your death. And so, it is satisfied with that death instead of yours. You don't die. And so you get to live. And while I want to stay focused on this, there's a lot more (laughs) to living than just surviving. To being a believer, that is. But it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your perfect substitute? The perfect lamb? Is Jesus Christ's blood on your door, on your heart? Because if it is, then you have nothing to fear from God's wrath. Because the wrath was satisfied in the death of Jesus Christ, and God's wrath has passed over you. Now we pass right on by that phrase, nothing to fear. It's true. It's just like saying, that dog is big, that dog is small. But to really think about it, there's nothing to fear. 
nothing at all. Not just death, which is important, but even after life, after this life, for when the, really the real life begins. But there's nothing to fear in this life. We have God as our shield and our exceeding great reward. The Bible says, what can man do to you? But we need not fear death either. And since God's wrath has passed over you this one time, doesn't mean it's coming back. It passes over one time. It'll never come back your way and you will not be asked to offer sacrifice again, to go get the blood of Jesus again. It's done. Done once and for all. So when I see the blood, God says, I will pass over you. Those are sweet words, not from a wrathful God. From a father God, from a loving God. Who so loved his people that he provided himself. Because you or I didn't make Jesus Christ righteous. We didn't help him in anything. God provided this sacrifice. Because he so loved his people. Blessed be his name. I take special comfort that it is written, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Because I will be honest with you, there are some times I can't see the blood. There are times when my mind is so clouded, so filled with worries and doubts and fears, I don't see the blood. But it's not me seeing the blood that puts away my sin. It's not me seeing the blood that makes me safe. It's God seeing it. Thank you. Be reminded of that, the simplicity of the gospel. Breaking it down into words that we can understand. <laughs> well, let's close this worship service with number 232, When I See the Blood. I will pass over you, 232. <clears throat> and we'll stand together as we sing. <clears throat> 